about um, a feline model of mucolipidosis 2. Um, this feline model exists at, at the National Referral Center for Animal Models of Human Genetic Diseases. It's a bit of a mouthful. It's a NIH-funded center. This center has been funded since 1974. Um, the original PI was Dr. Patterson. And um, the real mission of starting the center was to identify, characterize, and make available for research new and existing large animal models of, of human genetic disease. <laughs> so those of you that have um, attended these meetings before um, probably had the privilege of meeting uh, Dr. Mark Haskins. So he took over the center from, from Dr. Patterson and ran it for a long time and was um, hugely integral in establishing most of the animal models that we have um, and developing a lot of, a lot of the, the current therapies. Um, unfortunately for us, he decided to retire last year. Um, we had a, a great little retirement party for him where we all wore these crazy little um, beards and wigs um, in his honor. Um, but fortunately for us, when he left, Dr. Um, Charles Beat, who is a veterinary neurologist and a um, PhD, he took over as PI of the referral center and the, the P40 funding mechanism. So what exists at this, at this center that we have um, at Penn Vet? We have about 20 or so animal models right now. Um, a lot of them are lysosomal storage diseases, but we also have models of skin diseases, heart diseases, and other um, musculoskeletal diseases. So what models do we have right now? Um, feline alpha manosidosis, a canine model of fucosidosis, canine model of globoid cell dystrophy, more commonly referred to as Crabbe disease, um, feline model of mucolipidosis 2, which I'll be um, talking about in more detail, and then various feline and canine models of MPS1, 3A, 3B, 6, 7, and a cat model of uh, Neiman Pick type C. So what does it mean to identify and characterize and then make available for research? Most often animals come into a clinic or to a veterinary hospital and a veterinarian suspects that they have a lysosomal storage disease. So then we get one of a uh, sample from these animals and um, one of our labs runs with um, an enzyme activity assay and if they're found deficient for one of the lysosomal enzymes, we then do DNA sequencing and determine if they have any of these, um, these known mutations um, that we've already published. If they have one of these known mutations, um, it, that's, that's pretty simple, and we know we've just captured another, another animal um, that we've already identified. If, if it's deficient in one enzyme, but we don't know the mutation, then we do sequencing um, and find the new mutation. If it's a model we haven't previously captured, then we um, really have to sit down and decide, is there a need for this model? Is there a need to learn more about this disease? Is there a therapy that's um, in the pipeline that would be um, valuable to have a large animal model? And if so, um, what we do is we establish breeding colonies, so we keep carriers of female and male um, and grow out the colony you know, as, as big as the need requires. Um, most of these are autosomal recessive diseases, so um, breeding is a challenge, so statistically we get one quarter of the offspring are affected. Um, and once we have an affected animal, um, we, we really try to characterize the disease, so we learn about how the disease is presenting in the animal, um, we also do what's called biomarker discovery, where we try to find some biochemical ways to track disease progression. Um, and then eventually the goal is um, to use these animal models for, for therapy development. So most of you um, are familiar, but just a, a brief recap um, for mucolipidosis 2. Um, it's an autosomal recessive disease that has inherited a, a mutation in the GMPTAB gene. And unlike most lysosomal storage diseases, we got, we got a good um, introduction of this from Paul. Most of them have a deficient hydrolytic enzyme, which is responsible for, for degrading a substrate in the lysosome. Well, ML2 is very different because it's missing a phosphotransferase protein. So when you don't have this phosphotransferase, um, these lysosomal enzymes don't get the mannose 6-phosphate tag, which Paul also introduced. So in a normal cell, um, you have the GMPT, you stick a mannose 6-phosphate tag on these enzymes, 
and they go to the lysosome. And only in the lysosome at a very acidic pH are these enzymes functional. So in the case of, of ML2, when you don't have GMP TAB, these lysosomal enzymes don't get the necessary tags, so they don't get targeted to the lysosome. Instead, they, they're mistargeted and they're hypersecreted and they go outside of the cell. But outside of the cell, the conditions aren't right, the pH isn't right, and these enzymes are no longer functional. So it's not like most lysosomal diseases where there are no enzymes. The enzymes are being made, they're just ending up in the wrong place. However, it's also not just one enzyme because all the lysosomal enzymes require this, this tag. So multiple lysosomal enzymes are, um, are missing in ML2 or not functioning. So um, when you don't have the enzymes functioning in the lysosome, instead you get intracellular um, inclusions inside the cell. So some of the hallmark features of ML2 are um, coarse facial features, severe skeletal abnormalities, cognitive impairments, and delayed motor development. Um, death most often occurs in the first decade of life, but as with all lysosomal storage diseases, there's um, really some variability in the onset and progression of the disease based on the specific mutation um, of the patient. So animal models of ML2. Um, animal models, as I mentioned, are important in learning about the disease and then developing therapy. So there's currently three animal models of mucolipidosis 2. The first is a zebrafish model. I won't go in, into detail, but this is a morpholino-based knockdown strategy. This has been well described by um, Heather Fleming and Steve and her husband Richard Steve. Um, and in, with these um, zebrafish in the embryos, you use um, this morpholino knockdown strategy to make phosphotransferase deficient. And, and these fish do have um, some of the clinical signs that are seen in ML2, especially with cartilage and bone. So, they're largely using this animal model to find really specific pathways um, in cartilage and bone, and they have um, recently published a paper also where they compared some of the changes in, in the zebrafish to the long bones in some of our cats that they analyzed, and um, they did see um, consistency between those two models. There's also um, knockout models of ML2. So, um, with these models, you either knock out a, par a portion or the whole GMPTAB gene. And again, there are some similarities um, to, the, to the human phenotype. These mice, they're smaller, they have skeletal abnormalities, they have um, decreased body weight, and you can see some of the, the facial differences um, in, the, in this model as well. And, and lastly, there's the, the cat model. So the cat model is spontaneously occurring, or it's a naturally occurring model. Um, we didn't create the mutation um, as was done in the, the zebrafish and, and the mouse. And this is a nonsense mutation that occurs in, in exon 13 of the feline GMP TAB gene. So this, this model was, was first identified at Penn Vet in the lab of Urs Eager, and um, the characterization was published back in 2003. So what they, what they found when, when they first discovered this model and, and bred the colony was that um, the, the lysosomal enzyme activities in the serum of these ML2-affected cats were significantly elevated above normal litter mates. So this is an example of just some of the lysosomal enzymes. You have alpha manocytosis, beta glucuronidase, and alpha fucosidase. Um, these are significantly higher than, than their normal litter mates, and again, that's because the lysosomal enzymes um, are detargeted um, because of the lack of mannose-6-phosphate. And when they looked at fibroblasts or skin cells from the affected kitten, they also saw these um, typical um, eye cell cytoplasmic inclusion bodies. And with the cat, you see um, you see some facial abnormalities. So these cats, they have some some thickened eyelids, their eyes are wide spaced, they have these kind of um, flat, broad faces, they have a, a, a depressed nasal bridge, and they have short and, um, and low set ears. As far as skeletal abnormalities, you see um, bowing, uh, this is the, the radial and the ulnar bones, um, you see delayed mineralization at the ends of most of the long bones, this is in comparison to, to a normal litter mate cat. And, um, and the, the spinal cord, we also 
see shortened um, vertebral bodies and um, the spinal processes are also misshapen. So these are some of the skeletal abnormalities that you would expect to see in an animal with, with ML2. Also, when looking um, at the eyes, compared to, compared to a normal cat and an ML2 cat at 2.5 months of age, um, you can see some, some thinning um, here of the, the retinal venules, and by um, five months of age, which is about endpoint for these animals, um, there is pretty severe retinal degeneration. So this paper um, covered a lot of the symptoms of, of eye cell disease, or ML2. However, it didn't talk about um, any central nervous system involvement. And we know that the vast majority of lysosomal storage diseases have, um, have severe central nervous system dysfunction, which contributes a lot to, to the mortality and morbidity associated with lysosomal storage diseases. So um, some neurologic clinical manifestations that have been um, previously shown in, in mucolipidosis too include optic atrophy or visual loss, um, corneal clouding, deafness, and cortical atrophy, which is um, basically atrophy of, of the brain. So these, um, other than looking at the retina, these um, other components of neurologic manifestations had not previously been evaluated um, in the feline ML2 model. Then about a year after that paper came out, um, there was a study in the ML2 um, mouse. And this study, for the first time in an animal model, showed that there are neurologic abnormalities associated with ML2. So this study showed that ML2 mice have progressive neurodegeneration, including um, neuronal loss, um, astrocytosis, which is the increase in the number of astrocytes, um, microgliosis increase in the number of microglia cells. Those, those together um, typically indicate a neuroinflammatory response in the brain. And they also showed um, for Kinji cell de depletion, so for Kinji's are a specific population of neurons in the cerebellum. So these mice were also moving for Kinji cells. Um, so this was really the first kind of insight into real pathology of, of um, the nervous system in ML2. So at this point, I kind of wondered, are there similar neurologic abnormalities that are present in the, in the feline model of ML2? Because um, no one had really ever look, looked at the brain. So at this point, I applied for a, a small pilot study um, grant at, at Penn, the Orphan Disease Center, and this was supported by the Million Dollar Bike Ride. So it was a a short study in, in terms of large animal models. It was for one year. Um, so, so what we did was basically we were specifically looking at is there any any central nervous system disease associated with, with the ML2 cats. One of the real advantages of large animal models over mice and fish is that we can do some more sophisticated clinical evaluations. So in these cats we can do routine neurological examinations, we do um, what's called brainstem auditory evoked response testing, which measures both the central and peripheral aspects of hearing in animals. We also do nerve conduction velocity testing, which measures the function of peripheral nerves, um, MRI, and we ended up also doing some CT scans, and then the visual and retinal exams that um, were also previously um, shown to be um, abnormal in the ML2 cats. So this is back to, to the mouse study real quick. Um, and when they looked at the, the nervous system in the mouse, um, they found that there were sensory motor impairments, and the most common way to measure this in the mouse is, is doing rotor rod. They did some other tests as well, but they found that at one month, um, the ML2 mice were performing um, slightly um, poorer than their normal controls um, on the rotor rod, but as disease progressed to 4.5, uh, 4 to 5 months of age, the, the ML2 mice were, were really um, significantly doing worse on, on the rotor rod, so this is the, the time that they were um, able to stay on the rod. Now, we cannot put our cats um, on a rotor rod, unfortunately, or do the wire hang test or any of the other really um, easy ways to quantify sensory motor um, deprivation like they do in the mice. But we do do routine physical examinations. We weekly um, videotape our cats, so then we can go back and, and look at changes that we've seen over time. And we, we do um, routine neurologic examinations. So most of you that have um, seeing normal cats can appreciate right away 
that there's severe skeletal um, abnormalities in this cat. You can see contracture of, of all of the limbs, so it's, it's walking with its limbs kind of short, low to the ground. You can notice that it has um, some abnormalities in its paws here. Um, as far as the face, you'll notice some of those changes that I showed. There's a, their ears are low and, and short, and they're, um, now it turns around, but depressed um, nasal bridge and just a really, um, a really broad face. There's actual um, changes in, in, this, in this spinal column, too, that have, like, you'll maybe notice that there's a real stiff neck and stiff gait, and this cat also holds its, its tail. Um, differently. So there's a, a lot of gait abnormalities and this cat obviously isn't able to, to get around well anymore at this at this point in disease progression. Um, uh, but Matt also knows that these are really, really, really sweet um, cats. It's like one of the best models that, that we have at Penn. They're, um, they're just, yeah, they're really nice. Um, we did the neurologic examinations and we didn't see a whole lot of, of changes on the routine neurologic examination. We did see um, increase what we call post-rotary post -rotary nystagmus, which is where you measure um, kind of changes in the sideway movement of the eye. And those were increased um, about 3.5 to 7 times normal cats um, by 12 weeks of age. That was really the only thing that jumped out in the neurologic exam, the reflexes and um, the other... Um, things that we test and typically see in some of our other real severe diseases were, were not present in these cats. So in the year that we had to complete the study, we ended up enrolling seven cats. Um, the survival was 20.7 weeks of age, um, was the mean the standard deviation of 2.6 weeks of age. Um, this is a relatively, relatively narrow range for when you eventually try therapies you don't want some cats surviving to 10 and some cats surviving to 50 because then when you do the therapy you really have no idea um, if it's working. So it's a relatively um, narrow range of, of survival. And as far as the, the clinical evaluations that we did over time, so we did most of our evaluations at like 6, 12, and 18 weeks of age. So we measured brainstem auditory evoked response testing, and in the, in the ML2 cats, here you can see that at 6, 12, and 18 weeks of age, the hearing threshold was already um, increasing, and it, it continued to increase with disease progression. Um, you can see here as the significance continued to increase. So this is the first time we've ever done VAR in the ML2 cats, so we did identify that, that these cats are experiencing deafness, which um, if you'll remember from that, Table of clinical manifestations in the patients is also um, one of the symptoms that the, the patients are, are having. So one of our other um, routine tests is the nerve conduction velocity. We use um, electrodes to stimulate different peripheral nerves to see if they are appropriately um, conducting. So when we looked at the tibial nerve and the ulnar nerve, we saw um, normal conduction velocity. There was no um, significant change in, in how fast these, these nerves were conducting. Um, however, when we looked at the superficial radial nerve, which is a sensory nerve, um, we did see a reduction in, in conduction time in, in this specific nerve. One of the cats did perform normally, so this is a, a bit of an outlier, so I'm not sure if, you know, as we evaluate more cats where, you know, where the statistics will end up lying, but this is um, some indication that maybe in some of the sensory nerves um, these cats are having um, some conduction issues. And kind of one of our most um, surprising findings was um, on MRI. Um, these cats had for years undergone routine radiographs, so they had x-rays of every bone in their body, but no one had um, done an MRI on these cats yet. So part of our natural history study was, was to do MRIs on these animals, and this is one of our, our ML2 cats at 11 weeks, which is about halfway through disease progression, and this MRI looks pretty normal. So um, Patty Dixon did a really nice job yesterday explaining what an MRI looks like. This is a little bit different of a, of a view and a type of MRI, so this is a T2-weighted MRI. Here, this black line um, in the middle here, that's white matter, um, and then it, that's where a lot of the connections of, of the cells take place, and then you have the surrounding gray, gray matter, which has a lot of the the cell bodies, and in this um, type of MRI, the, the white space is, uh, is CSF, so the CSF is, is showing up white here. So you have these areas in the brain called ventricles where, that hold the CSF, 
In a normal cat, they should be like a tiny, tiny, tiny little slit. This might even be a, the early signs of hydrocephalus here, because in a normal cat, you usually don't even see that much uh, of the ventricle. But you can see in all of these cats as, that are older, so further in disease progression, they have severe hydrocephalus. In one of our oldest scans at 20 weeks, um, there was just really profound hydrocephalus in this cat. So you can see when, when the ventricles get this big, there's hardly any um, you know, brain matter left around those ventricles. So um, that, that severity of hydrocephalus was, was a little bit um, surprising but intriguing. So what are the causes of hydrocephalus in these cats? Or really, in, in any case of hydrocephalus, what, what are the possible causes? So one is the obstruction of CSF flow. The CSF should go through the ventricular system um, and eventually down to the spinal column. So if something at some at one point is, is blocking the flow, then CSF would accumulate um, forward of that blockage. You can also have overproduction of CSF, so you're making too much CSF. And you can also have brain atrophy, so the brain is disappearing, it's atrophying, and the CSF basically has to um, fill in, fill in that, that voided space. So when we saw this um, hydrocephalus in, in these ML2 cats, we kind of went back to the case studies. It's always good to go back to the literature and see you know, exactly what has been seen in ML2 patients over the years. So there are case studies of hydrocephalus going back as far as um, published reports that I could find as far as 1987. And some of these um, cases showed that hydrocephalus was occurring um, was what's called craniosynostosis. So what is craniosynostosis? It's a premature fusion of the cranial vault. So your cranial bones are, are forming in the first few weeks of, of life and um, they're separated, the cranial bones are separated by, by sutures. So you've um, oftentimes heard of fontanelles or soft spots in babies and these are normal because um, the sutures kind of close with time to allow the brain to continue to grow. So what they're finding um, in, in ML2 patients is that there's premature closure of these sutures. And not just one suture, the studies were finding um, three to four sutures were prematurely closing. And when these sutures close early, this is causing obstruction of the CSF, um, and this specifically at the fourth ventricle outlet. So this kind of goes back to the first potential cause of hydrocephalus that I mentioned. So um, the premature closing is obstructing, is obstructing CSF flow. There's, there were multiple case reports in this one. The author was even um, emphasizing that, that this could be one of the very first symptoms of eucalyptidosis too, and that you know if, if a child um, happened to have a CT scan or MRI, and this was one of the findings that maybe um, doctors should, should really look at ML2 as, a, as a, you know, one of the possible um, reasons. And then again, as recently as, as um, 2014, a case study was showing um, that the diagnosis of craniosynostosis is really evident clinically. Um, you do a CT, and again, they found four of the different sutures were prematurely closed, and this led to um, diffuse thickening of, of the skull bones. So at this point, um, I did a serial um, CAT scans of, of CAT scans of the CAT, CT scans of ML2 CATs. Um, to try to determine if, if um, this was this premature clo closing of sutures was one of the causes of hydrocephalus in this model. Um, one of the issues that I ran into is that it is not known when sutures normally close in cats. So at what age should all of these sutures be closing? So are the ML2 cats really closing early or not? Um, so we've acquired um, the data serially and a couple of the ML2 cats, and now we're going back and doing CT scans on normal animals to try to figure out um, what, the, what the normal time frame is. There wasn't really obvious evidence of, of premature closure, closure of the sutures in the ML2 cats. Um, we didn't see that real um, diffuse thickening of the skull, so right now we can't really rule in or out um, if that's one of the one or the only cause of, of hydrocephalus. Um, one thing that we're um, also is, is probably a little bit more likely in this model is um, brain atrophy. So you can see here, this has also been reported in ML2 patients. This is an, another MRI kind of from the side, and you see this 
this space up here. This is um, this a sign of cortical atrophy, and again, the en enlarged ventricles. So one of uh, a very kind of crude way of trying to first think, determine if there's brain atrophy is just collecting um, whole brain weight. So post-mortem, we um, weighed all of the brains of, of the ML2 cats. And we do believe at this point that we're seeing um, reduced brain weight compared to normal cats. However, the data that we have collected in the past on normal cat um, brain weight, these cats are a little bit older, so average 23.7 weeks compared to the ML2 cats where it's only um, 20.6 weeks. So um, we're going to try to collect some normal um, cat brain weights of slightly younger cats just to make sure this um, isn't due to an age difference. However, we doubt that the um, nine gram difference is, is due to a three week difference in age. So um, we're continuing to kind of look into um, the brain atrophy. We're also doing um, on histopathology some specific stains um, um, to try to determine if there's actual atrophy in the brain. So post-mortem evaluations. Um, so once the, the cats reach what we call um, humane endpoint, um, the, the, cats, the cats are euthanized, and we collect the brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, and a, a large number of peripheral tissues, heart, lung, liver, spleen, um, muscle, um, a, a really large number of tissues that we then we can um, <coughs> study these animals. So this is, is one of the MRIs that I showed, and this is basically one cat just going through the brain, and then this is the brain that, that we collect post-mortem, and we use a brain matrix, and we divide the brain into to really small pieces. And we, we take one half of the brain, so one hemisphere, say the left half, and we freeze that tissue, so then we can evaluate um, different enzymes, different lipids, so that's stored, stored frozen. Then we take the right half of the brain and um, we do what's, what's called um, parasitic <coughs> bedding and putting it on the slide, so we fix the tissue, then you put the tissue in these little cassettes that comes out in these, um, these paraffin blocks. Then you use a machine called a microtome, you make really thin slices of the brain, um, you put it on slides and then you can do a variety of stains and look at um, the brain under the microscope to learn about um, specific pathology. So what did they see in the ML2 mouse that um, was of interest that we might want to follow up on in the cat? So the first thing they did is um, PAS or periodic acid shift, which is a really common stain in lysosomal storage diseases. It's not really specific, but um, it stains a lot of different um, substrates that commonly accumulate in like normal storage systems. So this is a widely used stain. And in the ML2 mice at 12 months of age, they did see these um, PAS positive inclusions um, throughout the brain. Um, they also looked, I'm um, not going to go through each of these stains um, in detail, but this is basically a, a survey for um, neuroinflammation, if you will. So IBA1 is looking at microglia. This is looking at ubiquitin A proteins, um, GFAP, and MAC2 is a, another inflammatory model. So GFAP is astrocyte, sorry. So um, what they found is at six months of age, you're starting to see some, some increase in these microglia cells. So um, here's some positive microglia cells and astrocytes and some, the MAC2 staining, the ubiquitin is a little harder to appreciate. Um, but then by 12 months of age, this was really obvious. So you see a, a major infiltration of microglia and, and astrocytes. So this indicates that neuroinflammation is, a, is occurring with this model, um, but it may take, it may take some time um, for, it, for it to really appear. And lastly, they looked at LAMP, which is lysosomal associated membrane protein one. This is again a common stain to do in lysosomal storage diseases because increased LAMP kind of indicates lysosomal dysfunction. And they found that at 12 months of age that there was increased um, LAMP staining um, in, in the brain of, of these ML2 mice. So this, again, is just a good indicator of, of lysosomal dysfunction. So what we did was we re repeated all the stains that they did in the mouse plus some other standard stains um, that are in our lab to see what to see what we saw in the in the ML2 cat. So again, after you take the whole brain, you can put it on a slide. You can stain it. So this is our periodic acid shift stain of an example of one of the ML2 cats, and we did not see those um, 
really dark pink purple uh, accumulations of storage material that they that they saw in the mouse. Uh, one thing to think about is that our our cats are only 20 weeks of age when we put them down, and um, the PAS positive granules they found in the ML2 mice were at 12 months of age. So at 12 months, that's almost a normal lifespan of, of a mouse anyway. So it's much further um, progressed than, than our cats. So if our cats could live to one year or five years or six years, um, would we start to see some of that appear? Um, you know, we, we, we can't really say, but, it, but it's possible. Um, I also did an iron erichrome stain. This is another standard stain that I do in the lab. Um, and it's specific for myelination. And um, didn't really expect to see anything here, but this is completely normal. So there is no loss of, of the, um, the myelin, the white matter tracks. And some of our leukodystrophy models like um, Crab A and, and MLD, you see severe um, loss of myelination. So you're not experiencing any D or dysmyelination um, in this ML2 model. So then I went through that whole panel of the neuro um, inflammation markers. And um, just we kind of, one of my strategies is kind of do mul multiple stains um, at once. So here you have GFAP, which is those astrocytes in green. And then that staining called lamp lysosomal associated membrane protein in one. And um, there wasn't a clear increase in the number of astrocytes um, in the ML2 affected cat. It's a little bit harder to quantify because there was a lot of astrocytes in normal cats as well, but we didn't see a real obvious astrocytosis or a real you know, sign of, of neuroinflammation occurring. However, this lamp staining was really obviously increased in the ML2 cat. So in a normal cat, you'll see. Some, some little red staining here, and that's expected because there are lysosomes in a normal cat. However, um, this was dramatically increased in the ML2 cat. Some of the astrocytes are associated with the red, but you also see a lot of these red cells that, um, that aren't associated with astrocytes. So um, I also co-labeled with MAP2, which is a neuronal marker. So here you have a normal population of, of cat neurons, and this is the ML2 cat neurons. And again, you see a lot of this um, lamp staining. We did the IBA1 as well. There were some really isolated, activated microglia cells, but really no my, um, outstanding you know, microgliosis um, that was seen in the mouse model. So we don't think at the point that, that these cats are reaching endpoint that there's severe um, neuroinflammation. However, there's definitely the, the lysosomal dysfunction, the expansion of these lysosomal compartments um, is definitely there. And, you can measure it by the lamp stain. So back to the mouse um, study, one of the other things they did is called lipidomics. So you do mass spectrometry, and you're basically trying to identify which lipid populations are increased or decreased. And they did this in brain tissue. So they looked at cerebrum, cerebellum, and brain stem. They looked at um, three species of gangliosides and three um, ceramides. Basically what they found was um, we want to look at the second bar because they also looked at um, ML3. But the second bar they found decreases in GM1 in two brain regions, increases in GM2 in two brain regions. Um, GM3 was normal. And kind of a similar, similar story with the ceramides um, decrease in one ceramide, increase in another ceramide, and no change in the other. So basically, this is um, not really that informative, it's just helping to determine. Um, which species of, of lipids are, are increased or decreased in the brain. We prefer in our other models to use lipidomics as a biomarker. So we collect CSF um, and serum every month, and then we send it off for lipidomics so we can watch the lipids accumulate with disease progression. And then once we treat the animals, hopefully we see the, the lipids come down. Um, when you're working with a mouse, you don't really have that advantage of being able to take CSF every month. So instead, they looked at it in brain tissue. Um, Instead, I, I collected the, the CSF every month and then sent um, the CSF off for lipidomics. I looked at actually 35 different lipid species of, um, in contrast to the six they looked at in the mouse, but I did include the six they looked at in the mouse, so um, all the, the ceramides, the gangliosides, phingomyelin, as well as cholesterol and free fatty acids. And of the 35 um, different lipid species that were analyzed, um, there were no significant changes in the ML2 cat CSF. So, again, it's not real clear if, if the cats live longer and disease progress further, if um, we would start to see changes in the CSF, or maybe none of these lipids would be really secreted into the CSF. So, 
Um, I'll probably go back and have some of the frozen brain tissue looked at for um, for lipidomics to see if we can see some of the same changes they saw in the mouse, but really can't then use that as a biomarker because it's only a, a post-mortem analysis. So we've heard a lot um, this weekend already about um, therapeutic approaches for lysosomal storage diseases. Um, we know that enzyme replacement therapy is a great option for, for a lot of these diseases. Um, however, given systemically, we know that this can't, can't cross the blood brain barrier, so a lot of these diseases that have CNS disease um, have to be get, given directly um, into the CSF space. However, since ML2 is such a complicated disease, it's not just missing one enzyme. Enzymes are there, they're just detargeted, and there's a lot of them that are defective. So enzyme replacement really is not um, an, a, a good option for ML2. So one of the other things we've heard a lot about is, is gene therapy. So this is a monogenetic disease, just one gene is, is effective, which is ideal for gene therapy. So you, you take the healthy copy of the gene, you put it into a virus, um, specifically AAV or adeno-associated virus, is then injected, here we're showing intravenous injection, and the virus then releases the gene, which then expresses the, the protein. So adeno-associated virus is a small, non-pathogenic um, parvovirus. We've all been exposed to it and um, didn't really know it because it doesn't cause any kind of illness. It's a really simple virus. It has two genes, rep for replication and cat for capsid. So when you want to use AAV as a delivery vehicle, you take out these genes, put in your, your therapeutic transgene, and you drive this by a promoter and or enhancer, um, followed up by a polyadenylation um, signal. So there are over 100 serotypes of AAV. You keep hearing about these numbers that come after um, the vector. So the real leader in the field right now is AAV9. AAV9 is shown to go to the heart, the brain, the lung, the liver skeletal muscle, and AAV9 and RH10, when given systemically, um, can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. So this is really kind of the um, most widely used um, serotype of AAV right now. And intravenous AAV has been studied in many animal models um, and a number of the NPSs. So it's been shown in NPS um, 3D mice, NPS 3A mice, um, the canine model of NPS 7, um, and it's also been um, tested in non-human primates to, to, to test toxicity, biodistribution, um, and the immune response to the vector. And as you're all aware, um, preclinical studies and the MPS3A mice led to human clinical trial, which has dosed um, six patients, three low dose and three high dose. So as this trial closes out, um, this safety data um, should really help open open the door to intravenous AAV9 for other similar diseases. AAV9 has also been tried in a, um, a mouse model of ML2 already. So in this study, they used um, AAV8. Um, basically, they were, they were trying to see if the delivery of AAV8 attenuated bone loss, because um, bone loss is a major problem in this disease. So in this study, they um, delivered AAV8 at six weeks of age to, um, to ML2 mice, and they did demonstrate a significant increase in bone mineral density and content. Also, interleukin-6, which is a um, pro-inflammatory cytokine that's increased in the bones of ML2 mice, was decreased after gene therapy. Um, and so, most importantly, I think for this study, they, they say that it shows the ML2 is is amenable to this therapy. People have said, well, there's no way, you know, you can treat ML2 at all or with gene therapy. Um, so this is kind of a little bit encouraging that, um, that maybe um, gene therapy is an option for, for ML2. So with all of the, the data and other animal models, the um, preclinical safety data that's coming out, and the proof that AAV8 did um, have some impact in ML2, and we thought that it warranted at least evaluation in our, in our feline model of ML2. So we applied for a grant, which we just got at the beginning of this year. So this is um, the very beginning um, stages of this, of this study. So what's the plan for this study? Um, the first step was to clone the feline gmp TAB gene because um, to do gene therapy, you have to have a gene to put in it. And unlike most um, um, species that the, all the gene has been sequenced and is published, unfortunately, the cat's not there. So we had to make sure we knew the sequence of feline G, GMPTAB, and then um, we um, created that gene. We designed an AAV vector um, encoding this feline gene. 
we started with a really strong um, promoter that's kind of similar to the one they had in the AAB8 um, study. And before you want to test a vector in animals, you always test it in cell culture first. So took our vector and put it in HEK 293 T cells, which are just wild type cells. They already make um, this, this protein. And when we put it in, we saw toxicity and, and cell death. So we didn't know if, uh, well, they already make a normal amount, we're putting even more in. Um, could that be the reason of toxicity? So then we grew up ML2 fibroblasts and tested the vector into fibroblasts that were deficient in ML2 protein. And um, we again saw um, cell toxicity and death. So we tried some other ML2 cell lines, and so far we have not seen any toxicity or cell death in um, different types of ML2 cells. However, we could have made our vector too strong, too robust. So we created a second AAV vector and put it um, between a, and put the gene behind a much weaker um, promoter to drive the, the expression, and we're testing it in all of those um, cell cultures right now. We haven't seen any cell death to date. So. Can I ask a question? Is there any reason to expect that there's going to be a cross-corrective effect with this enzyme? So it's cell autonomous, you actually have to get the to, vector to the to cell. Itself. So the strength of the promoter right. may not matter. Right. It's, it just might be that um, we've, we've seen this before in transmembrane proteins too, if you give too much of it, you know, you need less of it when you're not trying to cross correct. Sure. So trying to cross correct, you want to, you know, make buckets of it, but because then you're secreting it all over, but if you're actually trying to target cells, then too much of it might even be really worse. Now. Yes. So. Um, so we put it behind a, a pretty weak, um, a pretty weak promoter, and so far, um, so good in the cell culture. Um, so then we're going to um, do a short study um, in mice, and this is just a, basically a toxicology study to make sure that the mice um, aren't going to have any issues. Um, we're mostly concerned about the liver, especially with AAB9. Um, putting it intravenous, you can um, see liver toxicity. And lastly, um, as soon as these mice studies finish up, we're going to test the vector um, in ML2 cats. The study plan is to enroll um, six cats. We're going to treat them at one week of age with the, um, by intravenous injection of the AAV9. Um, we'll do clinical evaluations, including radiographs, um, echocardiograms, MRI, and the retinal exams. We're also going to do um, the BAER and the neurologic examinations. We will collect um, serum and CSF routinely. And then our post-mortem evaluations will include enzyme activity, um, biodistribution of the vector to see where it's going, and then um, routine you know, histopathology. So um, kind of in conclusion, um, I've introduced you to our naturally occurring feline model of ML2 and shown some of the previously described biochemistry and skeletal manifestations. And then our re recently completed natural history study that we finished um, just in May, um, where we did find some central nervous system disease, including deafness, peripheral nerve deficiencies, um, some neuropathology. Um, and I took this data out, but we also did um, an analysis of cytokines and chemokines, um, and we did find some um, alteration of a few of those in the, the CSF of the ML2 cats. So now that we know that there is CNS disease, it really kind of helps us. Um, with our treatment strategy because we know there's skeletal disease, heart disease, eye disease, and now we know there's brain disease. Um, so if ML2 wasn't already difficult to treat, now we have to um, really come up with a, a holistic approach to treat the whole body. So we believe that the best strategy for that will be um, intravenous delivery um, of AAV9. And again, we're going to try to, our initial cohort will be young cats of all, about one week of age. Um, so that's... My conclusion, um, this work was done in the lab of, of Charles Veed and our collaborator at University of North Carolina, Stephen Gray, is helping us um, make the AAV vector. And of course, this wouldn't be possible without funding. So the Million Dollar Bike Ride funded the natural history study. And then um, three different MPS um, organizations came together, ISMRD, National MPS Society, and the MPS Society of Australia um, to fund some of our ongoing work.